unfortunately. Somebody just pinged me to remind me. Okay, well, I um, want to welcome Troy McGinnis. Uh, I worked first with, with Troy, oh, a long, long time ago um, on a project with the, We're with not the that Treasury. Old. <laughs> what? <laughs> We're not that old. <laughs> and um, I offered to take him to the airport and then took him to the wrong airport, if I remember right. But we managed we to get him back Google. on the plane. We followed Google. It took us to the cargo <laughs> entrance, not the passenger entrance of the of the airport. So, but we did get in there on time. But anyway, um, Troy, I was here about a year ago, did a, a talk on um, uh, forecasting. And so today he's going to be talking about dependencies. So I'm very excited to hear this. So turn it over to you, Troy. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, no problem. So let me share screen. All right. If you see my slides, Venture Management Scale. So this is a, a, a sort of a cut down version of something I do over four hours. So, um, yeah, dependency management scale. And you know, why did I get into this, especially since I'm from a metrics and forecasting sort of world? Well, this was the loop I used to see. Almost every consulting engagement I went to, there was just, I mean, I only got bought in when there was problems, right? Uh, there was frustration around predictability and the ability to forecast or the ability to uh, understand when we start work, when that work might go live. So there was frustration with the pace and the predictability delivery. So the knee-jerk reaction was to start adding teams and people en masse, scale our organizations. Surely if we add people, nothing can go wrong. And of course, they started seeing very little improvement for the amount of teams they added. In fact, they made the problem worse because now there are more team to, teams to manage. And that would lead to more frustration, which would lead to more teams. And soon enough, for developing a product which started out maybe with four or five teams, you have 100 teams, but you're not getting dramatically a lot more work delivered. You're just sort of increasing the, the stress and workplace homicide rate. And I think that what we're trying to do with sort of agile and scaling is to sort of maybe start sort of uh, taking a bite out of the frustration uh, and starting to sort of see when we add teams or people that we get some more improvement than uh, a little bit closer to what we expect. And, you know, I see that there are sort of three aspects to dependency management in, in workplaces. And yet we, we hardly ever talk about any of them. I, I think the agile world and the way it's training and frameworks teach managing dependencies it's a very narrow definition of dependency. So I hear a couple of off-the-cuff remarks, you know, well, we just reorganize our teams and cross-skill our teams and dependencies will go away. Well, you know, like there's, there's a, a fairly large amount of uh, <laughs> different technologies that are required. And do you really want to sort of have everyone having production access to install SSL certificates? You know, there's always going to be a reason why some skills, even because of economy of scale, or because of their sensitivity to privacy and reliability, you might want to compartment somewhere. So the three sort of uh, capabilities I think you need to grow in your organization around dependencies is first of all, the ability to capture and quantify the dependencies that you have, then find ways to reducing the impact of those dependencies for the ones that you currently have, so fix and reduce, and then also find and alter your process a little so that you can avoid common dependencies and plan around them more effectively. And until you can do these three jobs inside organizations, I don't think you're really handling dependencies in any, any coherent way. So the, these are the three aspects of dependency management that I think you need to grow inside organizations. And I'm gonna give you a, a bit of a hint on each of these three during this you know, 30, 40 minutes that we got together. All right, so that's dependency management. I think if you're gonna, you gotta manage all three, you gotta do all three tasks to uh, say you're doing dependency management. But first of all, I wanna start about what is a dependency. And I want you to think about in your head, when you joined this session, you were brave enough that you joined a session with the word dependency in it. Um, you had something on your mind. You sort of said, oh, that's important to me because of something. So what do you understand the word dependency to mean in the agile world? And this is the most common one I see. 
So then it's a handoff to another person or team to complete something. So the typical handoff dependency. Uh, multiple teams are required to contribute to a piece of work to get it delivered. And that requires that when one part of the chain finishes something, they hand it off to the next uh, part of the relay team and they go and hit and complete the race to deliver the feature. And that, that is a dependency. That's true. What about the inability to start something until you get something? Equipment, approval, something that you need before you can even start something. And you know, this is the traditional concept of dependency in the construction world. It's all about making sure that everyone has the ability to start something. It's not it's not about sort of getting it done and handing off. It's about not being able to start until. And that's that's valid in our world too. Often we we start things that are immediately blocked because we don't have something or we're waiting for approval so it sits in a backlog. What if, what if that thing you need is information? What if you can't get something and you can't do something because you don't know yet? You don't you need something from another another team about what they want and how they want it. And what if you need the other team to complete something? What if halfway through you need to sort of branch off, go get a, someone to open a firewall port so that you can sort of then test that you've got an end-to-end -end connectivity? So dependency, and you had your own definitions in your head at the beginning with, but all of these are valid types of dependencies that we will encounter in the agile world. And the you know, the just reorg or just cross train teams only really solves one of these. So if we just go about and view dependency management as just being an organizational problem, we will miss many reasons why work needlessly sits idle in what we would later call a dependency. So we need to broaden our definition of what dependencies are. Now for this session, I'm going to give you mine. And I'm going to take a small diversion. I'm going to start off by defining what a blocker is. Now, a blocker or impediment, if you're in Europe, a blockade, something that makes it impossible to start or finish something we want now. So if we have Kanban boards or Scrum boards or you do stand-ups, often the question is, is, are you blocked? Can you do the work that you're currently doing? And we used to put red sticky notes on yellow sticky notes to sort of say, this is blocked. Let's talk about it. Help me unblock this work. And that's all about that we couldn't finish something that we wanted to do now. But there was also many other pieces of work that were stepped over on a backlog, for instance, that we couldn't start. So one of the things I found is that we never flag blockers in the backlog. We only flag them in doing. And that aside, blockers happen. They make it impossible to start or finish something we want right now. And... When we, I contrast that with what a dependency is, the only difference is it's something we want in the future. So a dependency that we hit tomorrow, we actually have data and evidence that that has occurred before in the data why prior work was blocked or sat in the backlog unable to be started. So the only difference between a dependency and a blocker is perspective when you're looking. It's just a time shift. Uh, you'll be blocked. Work was blocked historically because of dependencies that you could have predicted and anticipated in the future and called a dependency. So blockers and dependencies to me are the same thing. It's just when you are going to encounter it. If it's in the future, it's a dependency. It's in the past, it's a blocker. And this is good for us because that means that if we analyze the data around blockers and impediments, we can understand the highest frequency and the highest impact reason work was delayed and go and solve it. So to manage dependencies better, you really start needing to get a handle on what impeded work being started or completed in the past. And that's sort of the way I like to... Uh, teach and get organizations to understand what their highest hitting dependency dependencies are and do something about it. So in summary, it's a blocker. If something you need right now can't be started, can't be finished, 
and it's the penalty if something in the future can't be started, can't finish, or shouldn't start. And why did I add sort of shouldn't there? It's because sometimes it makes no sense to start this feature if we can't go live of it until we do many, many other things. So you wouldn't, or possibly shouldn't, go and sort of update the way login works on your Android phone app and not do your iOS phone app at the same time. If they're using the same back end, you're going to break one of them. So there's sometimes what we're doing in dependencies is we're having to also coordinate our product offerings in unison. Uh, but essentially they're the same thing. It's just past or future as a reference point. And I got this, I didn't invent this. I stole this from uh, Diane Strode and Sid Huff who wrote a paper a fair while ago now, 2012, where they looked at just putting names of the types of dependencies that we hit in agile software development. And uh, the paper, the slides, we put a link in the chat window, it's gonna be in the email, but there's a link to the original PDF document there uh, in the slides. Um, it's probably worth reading, but I'll save you some time. It comes down to this table. It comes down to that they identify three different types of dependencies. Knowledge dependencies, task dependencies, and resource dependencies, which match sort of roughly what I said earlier about needing something, uh, needing someone, needing to learn something. And it comes down to sometimes you can be blocked starting or finishing work dependency because you need to know something and you can't proceed until you know it. Sometimes you need somebody to do something before you can do your part of it. And sometimes you need something or somebody specifically to, you need access to that person. You need the bricklayer on your site. So not that you can get a bricklayer elsewhere remotely, you need a bricklayer present. And these three different types of dependencies can't be solved by reorg. <laughs> I mean, you, if you just reformed your teams needing to know something, well, that would solve need, knowing how to do something, but it doesn't solve perhaps getting an expert proximity to your team. You're not gonna have an expert of every feature or story that you have on your team. We tried to do that by putting a product owner next to the teams. So we tried, Agile makes a, a small attempt at solving each of these dependencies, but it doesn't ever completely solve it. All right, so uh, tasks and resources. A again, my point is dependencies are bigger than just reorging skill sets and people into a better organized unit. And I want to caution you, if you go about doing that, and then your work type changes or you implement a new framework or you move to the cloud off an on-prem version, you start again. So your teams are always going to be poorly constructed. So you really do need to build the skill of how to handle these types of dependencies when they occur, because you're always going to be encountering new types and new stresses in your systems. All right. So this is my definition of what dependency management becomes. It allows us to start and finish work in the desired order with minimal blocking. So what we're trying to do when we're implementing dependency management across multiple teams is lubricating the process so that the in the order we want to do the work, we can start and finish it with minimal blocking. And why do I highlight desired order? Because what I see many companies dependency management means not choosing to do things that will ever be blocked by a dependency. And they're starting to pay prematurely sort of considering dependencies and choosing what they think can be done rather than what they want to be done. And that just decreases the customer value that we have. It also means that we never really make a step forward because our systems are really good at flowing yesterday's style of work through. So if you're currently on an on-prem product, uh, something that gets installed on a server and you're moving to the cloud, you will naturally find it easier to choose features that suit on-prem products. 
because moving to the on cloud stresses the process in a very different way. So our job in dependency management is change management of our organization structure to allow us to start and finish work in the order that we should do them, not the order that we could do them, because that just inhibits us being agile in the future. So dependencies actually make us be a bit more, uh, maintain history rather than moving forward in a, in a, in a value-driven way. Any questions or comments so far? Anything coming in on the chat there? Uh, put your questions in the chat. Anything coming up there, Mark? Nothing so far. Um, if somebody right. has questions, go and throw them in there and I'll try and make sure we get them in, in front of him. Good. This is really good stuff. All right. So now what I want to quickly give you is some quick wins. All right, Troy, so now you have to find what dependencies are and dependency management is and what the value of doing it is. It's not just in more predictability. It's about allowing us to do the types of work we should be doing in the future. So I, I just want to give you some thinking processes to precede you in your journey of starting dependency management. And I'm going to do this by this sort of um, three option sort of process there. I'm going to pose three questions. I'm going to pose questions to you, six questions to you. And I'm going to give you what's typically done now, something that is better than what's typically done now, and something that's even slightly better than what I think better is. And I want you to think about these as a continuum, because if you go after solving dependencies, you just bring the process to a complete halt. All right. All right. So, um, somehow I got into annotation. All right. So, dependency history and data. So, remember I said earlier that uh, dependencies are just uh, blockers of the future. So, in capturing dependencies data, what do we capture? What would help us manage the process? and tell us where it's worth us fixing our process. Well, what typically I see now when I go into organization is they really don't know what a dependency is. They have such a, well, it's just a handoff to another team. We solved that, we reorged uh, six times last year. Surely we solved dependencies. Well, you know, I'm sort of saying, well, if I look at why the teams couldn't start and finish their work, I ask them, I sort of say, why were you blocked doing your work historically? And they tell me. So I think capturing dependencies or capturing blockers is a great first step. Go and ask the teams during retrospectives, what stopped you starting the highest priority thing in the backlog? What stopped you once you started the highest priority thing? What made you pause and move on to something else? And you might be able to then start capturing the frequency teams are blocked based on opening firewall ports or the frequency teams are blocked based on questions to the product expert or the product owner or the times the team was blocked waiting on uh, images with a drop shadow of a certain size that fitted into uh, waiting for legal to sign off the privacy agreement, waiting for translations, waiting for uh, accessibility testing. What you want to capture is the reasons people were blocked because chances are they're going to be blocked by those same things in the future if you chose to do that sort of work. But when you're capturing that, what I want you to also do is capture how many days were lost based on those types of root causes. How many days did we lose based on waiting for content? How many days did we lose waiting for the external vendor to open firewall ports? Because you need frequency and you need impact combined because sometimes a very low frequency cause of delay has a six month impact. You don't wanna miss those. So you wanna capture frequency and you wanna capture the impact of those frequencies. And then you might wanna filter it by priority because what's the best dependencies to fix? The ones which delay the highest priority work 
because that allows us to move in the future the direction we want to head. If you just look at just frequency, the squeaky wheel, a way of prioritizing blockers, what you might do is fix a blocker that only fixes low priority items. And you don't want to do that. You want to blend frequency and impact together in some way. All right. Eradicating dependencies. All right, you're now ordained dependency, the chief dependency removal officers of your companies. What are you going to do? How are you going to define your goal? My job as chief dependency removal officer is to do what? Well, I always hear uh, my job's to remove all dependencies, to get rid of all of them. Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't think that way. Because dependencies will change depending on the type of work that you choose to do. And if you are being agile and innovative and choosing new types of work to do, you're going to be hitting new dependencies in the future of different style than you had in the past. So if you only go after dependencies you had in the past, you're actually defining a process which makes it easy to do the types of work you did in the past, not the future. So I think what you have to do is be eager to fix dependencies, but be a good old coupon cutter and really look for value in the dependencies that you're going to remove. How do you do that? You use the data you collected in the previous question. You, you, you use impact and frequency, but you also apply a lens of, and is this likely to occur in the future? Is this something that's going to block us from moving a certain direction in the future? And when you do that, what you're going to look for is start off by removing the easiest to fix highest impact and dependencies first. So you get at least some traction and then move on to just removing the most common impactful dependencies based on data. So I'm not going to say don't go after the low hanging fruit, but I think better than going after low hanging fruit is using the data you captured in the previous point, how often we get blocked, how many days we lose when we are blocked based on some root cause and going after those. So strive for being data driven in the dependencies you go after. But I'm a data guy, right? So what do I know? But uh, I'm of course going to say that. But it's, uh, it's a very important aspect we're looking at. Spend your time wisely on fixing dependencies because there's going to be pain because you're changing people's worlds and processes they love using. All right, now you're in quarterly planning or monthly planning. Uh, all right, everyone. SAFE says that we should analyze and spend some time talking about dependencies. I've scheduled two minutes for it. Uh, so I think that we probably underspend time in planning dependencies. How do I define that? Anticipating and predicting, crystal balling the reasons why if we chose to do a certain piece of work, where might it get blocked? <laughs> so again, I'm, 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 I'm trying to anticipate reasons where blocked. Uh, did someone raise their hand there? Was there a question? Didn't see any, but this is a good time to pause. Anybody uh, have any questions about where we are so far? I had a blue pop-up pop up on the screen, but one of my dependencies nowadays are uh, the reason I can't read things is I, I need to put these on so I can actually read what the hell it said. I was trying to look cool and young, but uh, you know I need to embrace <laughs> embrace my age and, uh, and abilities there. So uh, next time that pop-up comes up, I'll be able to read it. So you're in planning. What do I see? I see either two extremes. I see everyone so burnt by dependencies in their prior quarter that they talk about dependencies at excess and sort of saying, we must, we must analyze what we're going to do and predict every sort of dependency that we're going to have. I mean, again, their narrow definition of dependency, if it's safe, they put red string between the sequence of work that they need to get done. So this needs to get done, that, that. So they they particularly spend their time anticipating that there's going to be handoffs, but they don't look at 
what do we need to know or what do we need or you know um what's going to block us in the middle of something they ignore all that so then i sort of see the other extreme where people just say it's too hard to just ignore dependencies let's just stack rank what we want to do pick those top five items and sort of let someone else sort it out uh they're both typical uh and they both are wrong right because you can either spend all of your time worried about things that may not occur or none of your time worried about things that could occur it's still a waste of time you're still not really dealing with the problem because you're not being data driven by it you you're speculating you become speculators um i think that the what you should at least do though is sort of say if we do x we're definitely going to need help from y and come up with those known handoffs that are going to occur so that there is shared understanding that by choosing to do x you're going to need capacity from other people but i don't think that you should preemptively try and understand that capacity to three decimal places uh, i think you're going to need to by scaling and having multiple teams work on things together you are opting in for uncertainty so the best you can do is make sure that people don't 2x or 3x plan what they might be able to achieve and that's the order of magnitude i see when i see planning without worrying about dependencies i see a team or a set of people who are the constraint in the process be oversubscribed by two to three times in other words They've got two to three times more work than they will ever achieve in that period of time. So anything you do that gets us down to less than two times to three times re needing uh, requiring a constraint in the process, good job you. You're, you're actually being pretty damn good at it. So um, with that, put the lightest process you can in your planning step to make sure that you identify the constraint and make sure that that constrained team says that they have some chance of achieving what they need to do in that period of time. Don't worry about everyone else. When a team is given the choice to start work within their process, and now we're in the middle of the sprint or middle of the quarter, what should they choose to start working on? So how, how do teams pull something into their uh their doing column do they start work that's immediately going to require and be blocked by another team that makes no sense but it's typical right and if you don't understand the capacity of the other teams downstream from you or what you need if you haven't discussed what you need to learn what you need access to or who you need access to you haven't asked those three questions about a piece of work chances are you're going to pull it into doing and immediately have it sitting idle. And it sounds stupid, but it's also common. <laughs> so until you can get people thinking about, you know, what do I need to learn? Who do I need access to? What else do I need to be uh, to do or have done before I can start this work? You shouldn't start the work. So uh, I think even during stand-ups, the questions that are asked, if someone says that what they want to start working on, you should probe. Is there something, do you need access? Do you need, is there someone I need to get you uh, a meeting with to learn something? Do you need some time to do a spike to understand how we're technically gonna do that? Do you need to, uh, you know, um, access to more infrastructure or hardware or firewall ports? Do you need uh, someone from the localization team to, you need someone from the accessibility team? Do you need someone from the performance team? What about operations and logging? You're gonna be probing for reasons why they won't be able to start or finish that work that they, they wanted to do. Now, the other thing I see is that if there is a chain of dependencies that we do this work and then it's gonna to go to this team, this team, and this team, I see a lot of organizations not start that work until they get a thumbs up from all the teams downstream that they're ready to accept it. That means nothing's ever ready to be started, right? Because how you're asking that team without knowing 
between now and when you finish it, will they have capacity to do the thing that you're doing? At best, uh, you know, toss a coin because it's probably going to be equally as accurate as what you're getting by asking people to have a, uh, to ask all the downstream teams that you're ready to do this. Um, I think the best you can do is to at least understand that there's going to be a handoff to the next team. And if that next team can't start it roughly when you anticipate you're finishing it, don't start it yourself because all you're going to do is start it and finish it and then stick it in someone's backlog sitting idle. So have an awareness of who's downstream, but don't go looking for uh, a, a clear path downstream. Because uh, it's the same thing that's going to happen. If I check traffic at 4 a.m. in the morning, it's a very quick trip from where I live into downtown Seattle. But when I leave at 8.30 a.m., it's, it's not a clear path downtown. So people will give you a, a premature thumbs up that they have capacity, but by the time you require that capacity, it won't be available. So the skill set really is in um, understanding that there is the chance that they have capacity, not that they definitely will have capacity. Anyway, now I don't commute, so it doesn't really matter anymore. Who do I, what do I care about checking traffic? All right, so now, Chief Product Officers, you're going to choose what features you're going to prioritize. Uh, what are you going to do? So often I see this happen is, is that, again, that premature optimizing of the work that we're going to do, if we're hamstrung by dependencies, I had one... One chief product owner, and this was a, a hundred team product, and uh, it was a it's a well it was a well known product. It was uh, extremely high use product, and I watched this product officer during uh, the last sort of months of a quarterly plan. There, just throw his hands up. I don't care what you do, just get something finished. I don't care what it is. So. You know, the, the chief product officer who was meant to be focused on value for the customer and the customer's advocate was just so frustrated that everything was being done, but nothing was releasable. And it was coming up to the quarter where they were going to do a quarterly release. And he was writing the release notes and there was nothing to put in the release notes. And he's just sort of saying, just give me anything. I don't care what it is. Well, of course, that's, uh, that's what happens when you're being and you don't, you have technical debt around dependencies in your process is that uh, everything gets started, but nothing gets finished. Uh, and I, I, you know, what would have you wanted him to do, her to do, you'd want her to be looking at something based on outcome value and have some faith that that thing is going to be done. But there are also things in our backlogs and processes that are, are more time sensitive than others. So, Helping your organization learn everyone, every team, understand product and its time sensitivity for features means that they will make a better local decision about what they choose to start. So compartmentalizing why things are being done just in a product owner means that when people and other teams are choosing what work they are going to start to do, make poor decisions because they do not understand how the business makes money and stays in business. So one thing that you could do to improve the rate of getting the right work finished, the things you want done rather than the things that can be done, is to make sure you educate all of your teams on why things are prioritized the way they are. So part of strategy is communicating to everyone in the organization that when you have a choice to start something, here's how I would like you to think about it so that these little decisions inside team dependencies are made more consistent with what the organization and customer needs. So they understand that the ultimate time sensitivity production is down. We should jump on the production issue first. That's a clear policy decision. But do they also know that there's going to be a
trade show coming up that you want to have a, a new releasable feature for the keynote. Do they also, everyone at Apple knows when the, when the keynote's gonna be and the release is gonna be. Everyone at Microsoft knows when the Office release is going to go out and what, the, what is gonna be in the keynote. You need to make sure that even every team member makes a decision consistent with strategy that you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, they're just gonna pull something easy and fast that they can do because we reward on throughput or we reward on low cycle time. We give all these rewards to people to choose easy and fast things because we think that that increases our performance numbers. So if you're tracking throughput or if you're tracking velocity and you're tracking cycle time, then you're encouraging people to not do hard, valuable things that they don't know how to do yet. You're choosing them to do the same things that they did yesterday. So I see the incentive you give people in your teams to do the right things that you need to be done, no matter how hard they are, no matter how risky they are, as giving you the biggest bang for the buck in getting dependencies and the right work finished inside your organizations. So it's nothing about reorg. It's about, it is about creating the incentive to be able to start and finish the work in the right order together. So how are you gonna handle those team handoffs when they occur? And uh, this is when you can make sort of uh, some, some very early win-ins. This is what I currently see, is that the teams work in isolation in JIRA. It's in their backlog. It's in their doing, it's in their done column. And through osmosis or some other magical sort of potion, the other team downstream finds out that you actually did finish it and that they could now start and do the next bit of it. So I see oftentimes huge delays in the other team saying, oh, you finished? Oh, we, we went, oh, crap. Oh, oh, gee. Now we need to work out how we get that done. So sure, you can tell the next team when you finish something. That is something that you could do that would mean, okay, we've finished it. Please, uh, at your convenience, prioritize it. It's of critical urgency, medium urgency, low urgency. But what if, what if you did just one thing? What if you just told the next team when you started something? So when you pulled a feature or some work into your doing column out of your backlog, you sent an email, a Slack message. You went to their stand up and mentioned, we started this work, it's progressing well. We do anticipate it being finished by the end of the sprint. Um, how can I help you? Uh, how can I help you do the handover? So that is uh, that is sort of a very in easy step that you could do inside your processes in your organizations is start sharing and having teams share when they start a feature, not when they finish a feature, or when they start a story or finish a story, start a piece of work or finish a piece of work because those things get combined together into, a, into an end, end product. So there isn't any one answer for solving the dependency problem inside organizations. My only tips are all or never process advice is just going to lead you to hardship and suffering. It just isn't, isn't, uh, you know, isn't the, uh, the way that it's going to, uh, no matter what, no matter how much you pay for the training and certification, all or never is never going to be an option. You've got to keep your mind open for better ways of doing it. Uh, so you've got to look for doable improvement, not impossible improvement. And I use this uh, typical better and best as a way to facilitate people contributing to something better even than what I said. I don't give them an endpoint. I just give them a couple of small starting steps and then sort of let them evolve into what those final uh, final steps are. Uh, so with that, that's that was all the pre-prepared material that I had. Um, opening up for questions. See, we've got a comment that this is literally the greatest agile training I've ever experienced. So that's a that's a positive. Okay. Um, Okay, does anyone have any questions? You can either raise your hand, just come off mute, or stick something in the chat, whatever is easiest. Any any thoughts for Troy? 
Yeah, the chat window, so I can maybe see some things here. Uh, yeah, so there were, oh, someone was putting uh, lots of quotes in there. Uh, actually, blocker clustering is exactly, uh, Richard Sendusky said, said, if you don't know blocker clustering, Google blocker clustering. Uh, that's something that um, Klaus Leopold sort of invented. And in the early days there, what it was, was that whenever we had work, we used to stick a red sticky note on top of um, the yellow post uh, yellow blocked work. And that's what we would talk about during standup. And uh, it used to break my heart when I used to look at the garbage bin near the Kanban board and see all these red post-it notes in there. And I used to sort of drop to my knees a la platoon going, why, why are people throwing away such valuable data? So on those red sticky notes, whether you use them in, in JIRA or whatever, make a note of what, why things were blocked, blocked by lack of content and put a little sort of, stroke mark on each of them to count the number of days that that blocker was in process and just from that you can start clustering the common causes missing content waiting for external partners to do stuff you can start capturing those and summing up the number of days lost so there is your frequency and your impact data ready to go so the ones with the most days blocked most frequent that you can fix go and do those uh, in my training, of course, of course, I'm a consultant, so I have to have a quadrant model. I just put frequency on a Y axis and impact on an X axis and get people to stick them as how often they occur and how many days we often lose due to it. And I just deal with the top right hand quadrant. Um, but that's just the way I roll. I love quadrant models. Uh, but blocker clustering was where it started. Google it, and learn it. So I see Angelo has his hand up. So. Angela, you want to ask your question? Yeah, Mark, thank you. Um, and and Troy, I just wanted to comment that <clears throat> this strengthens the concept and idea that I, I try to coach with teams that I work with about being ready. And if you're in Scrum, about being sprint ready. Um, if there's a dependency, then it's it's not ready, right? It's not it's not going to increase a level of success that we're going to be able to develop something and be potentially releasable at the end of the time box. Um, and I also like the call out that you put out there about this all or never, right? Um, and we have a tendency to look for that silver bullet or the perfect, perfect approach where there's usually, it's usually just the lesser of two evils. Um, and, and the, you know, the better and the best of, of informing a team of when we start versus when we're finished, right? So they have time to be prepared. Right, so that when we're done, if we're being dependent on, they can get ahead and plan for <clears throat> and get whatever they need to get prepped up and ready to go. So awesome, awesome talk. I appreciate it. Thanks, Angelo. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah, I, I mean, it is frustrating that, you know, I go into organizations and they almost look sort of frustrated. You know, we implemented this new framework and it hasn't made a difference. I'm like, okay. Uh, I'm unsurprised. And they're like, why are you unsurprised? Well, that's why I make a living. Uh, and it's sort of like, um, it's also, it's simpler and harder than they expect to solve, right? Most of the time that they, they just choose to do too much and it just gets congested and, uh, some poor old constraint in the process is just being hammered and walloped. So, you know, I think, Going back to our roots, finding a constraint and making sure that we understand that we don't overwhelm the capacity of that constraint is the solution. So you can do that by either trying to start less or being better at identifying where your constraints are in your system. And um, it's not rocket science. It's not like hitting a meteor with a with a four miles million light miles away in a with a rocket or anything. It's not that. It, it's, yeah. it's it's a much um, much simpler yet we uh yeah I, li I like to say that it's it's so simple that it can't be true <laughs> but let's try yeah, it right <laughs> it's so simple you can't bill for it it's a problem yeah, but, exactly. it's sort of a, but you but you can do certifications in it and i think that's the way other, <laughs> right. people have, other people have gone for sure thanks again thank you so richard had a question he, he was asking about a a reasonably objective way to measure estimate the value. That's a good point. I um, I start off my first measure is something called uh, the wrong orderometer. <laughs> uh, 
don't know what's on my screen. So let me just hit this for a second. Uh, let me just see if I can. I have this little wrong order meter <laughs> uh, because remember my view on dependency management is about it's it's that we plan to do a set of features and we delivered them in a, and we delivered a set of features. So this is what we plan to do at the beginning of a quarter or a period. And this is what we actually delivered. So I make people make a list of the things that they wanted to do. And then I make them make a list of the things they actually achieved. And I just give them this little score, wrong order remeter. Like, uh, well, we didn't sort of get stuff. And of course, if they, uh, if they did actually deliver um, feature one, you'll sort of see they get better. But if they um, didn't sort of, if they didn't deliver something that they wanted, um, it gets worse. And what I'm trying, the metric I'm trying to get them to is what caused you to have to do unplanned feature one? What caused you to have to do these other features? What caused you to miss feature one? So it's not so much a metric. The metric is how, how much were your plans dashed? <laughs> but I'm looking for the reasons that caused that to occur and solving those. So um, so often I, I just track this wrong order a meter score and sort of show that we're making strides in helping an organization be able to deliver what they wanted to deliver, not what they had to deliver, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. And the other one is, so I, I sort of, uh, if I had the perfect metric, of course, it would be uh, the minimizing the cost delay of items in the backlog. What you know, what was delivered with, was has the highest cost of delay reduced. But that's frightfully hard because people can't quantify what's the cost of not doing something very well. They they struggle to even quantify the cost of doing something very well uh, because it's often an unknowable number in advance. You only know after customers get it. So I think that um, a starting point <laughs> is to. Uh, make Agile do what it was intended to do, which was to get people to deliver work in the order that they wanted to do it and find out the reasons uh, which are in the way of that and solve them. If that makes any sense at all. That's that's interesting. Um, I, I like the, the wrong order. <laughs> that's great. And this is in, is this in one of your spreadsheets on your site? Yeah, it is. I'm not so what I found out that it's not in GitHub there. So let me um let me just find it and I'll put a link in here for you and then you can put a link in the um now and see I use GitHub and everything as my top drawer. Uh but sometimes I I forget to commit. Um <laughs> uh, so, so I uh I did that with this one because all of these all of these spreadsheets are out there on my GitHub. Uh but um they all come from real work. Like they all come from real engagements. And I, uh, I'm so exhausted by the end of some of these engagements or I, I so want to go elsewhere that I forget to, um, <laughs> get to put it in. Uh, so it's in the, it's in the chat window now. Oh, that's great. Uh, for that wrong order, Amita. Cool. Um, okay. Does anyone yeah, else I... have any other questions for Troy? I have uh, one other spreadsheet which might be interesting to people. Uh, this was another one of you look at the metrics of how to get organizations to understand priority better and so forth. Um, uh, this often, you know, like what I found was that remember I sort of said getting everyone in the organization, organization to understand strategy and priority means that they start and finish the right work in the right order. Well, I have one which looks at sort of um, strategy and priority and the teams you have and what what they want to deliver as a feature level and the work in getting that done. But what it builds is a visualization that helps people um, helps people see what's in progress and uh, so over the right hand side here is the prior, is the strategy. Then you get to sort of see the epic and the color coding is the urgency of it. 
So what you're trying to do is help the teams, the database team see, or the team UI, the UI teams, see that if they started update checkout pages, it connects to something of, of, uh, of medium priority. But the strategy for that is very high. So it helps them choose what they should start based on what it connects to higher up the chain in priority and urgency. And if you can get people to understand what work they start so they have the highest priority work started and finished before moving on to the medium and lower priority work, you'll find that the right order just emerges. And what I do is just um, by pulling this data out of JIRA and so forth is I can replay the quarter and see what was in progress at what period of time and ask sort of the teams, why on earth did you start Bitcoin <laughs> before you started getting Visa card and MasterCard done? So um, a lot of it is, is going back and helping the product and management org understand why some cockamamie decisions were made. And often it was, well, we didn't know what else to do. So in trying to try to help your organization visualize to the down to the individual story or work item level, what epics they connected to. Secondly, what this spreadsheet does is it color codes over here, how over capacity we've allocated the teams based on the historical work. So this team has, the database team has been given more work than it has ever achieved in the historical quarter. Team UI looks okay, although it's still more than 50%. Team UI one will be your constraint. So team UI one and the database team are your two constraints in this planning cycle. If you choose to try and undertake all of this work, you will at some point in time miss some of that work based on the UI one team and the database team. And I sort of say, let's put specific management around what order team UI one and the database team start their work. So I try and link capacity and constraints to strategy and product and what, what you're choosing to plan in the quarter up front. And it, again, it looks complex and it, it sort of is, but the only data you need really is just the ones in deep orange. You need a title of a strategy and priority if you want it color coded. For your teams, you need the team name and roughly how many stories or epics they get done in a period of time. For the epic that you're trying to do, you just need a title for it and what strategy it links to and what priority this epic is. Again, not not a not a huge amount of data. And then for the stories, you just need a title, what epic it connects to and what team's gonna do this part of it. And if you have start and finish date, you get that animation as to being able to play back time. So not a huge amount of, of, of data to get a fairly sort of in-depth visualization of end-to-end -end flow prioritization and capacity. Um, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's something that you might think of in doing the same. I think it's here somewhere. Uh, it's, it starts with P. I mean, I know we are. So I'll put that one in that window too. Again, just trying to get people to visualize and see the important things that they have to do. And, so, and if I if I understood what you're showing there, right, you're saying this, the database team and, and the UI team are the biggest constraints. So if you get something out of order in either of those, it's going to have the most repercussions for your overall ability to deliver. You're going to write all my work from furthermore. Yes, that's exactly okay. what I meant to say, but not that clearly. Thank you. That, I, that, that's an awesome thing to call out because um, I think a lot of times it's re very easy to optimize the things that least need it <laughs> and miss the stuff where it really matters. Yeah, I mean, team server side, the UI is the server side team. If you ever construct like this nowadays, it's um, they're the ones which are so fragmented that uh, you know they they would warrant having tight coordination with to make sure that they don't start a small piece of every one of these epics that they contribute to. 
<laughs> you want them to you want them to start the work that that finishes the highest priority epic before they move on to the next set. Uh, so there is value in coordinating these, but if Team UI gets it wrong, you are missing something huge. Okay. Because you up front, you know they're not going to get everything you plan done. Right. Whereas Team Server Side could do it as long as you get it in the right order. <laughs> okay. So it's uh, it's a uh, it's a complex uh, graphic, but yeah, cool. something to sit around and drink a cup of coffee over. Okay, well we're we're almost at the top of the hour. I don't see any other questions here. So uh, Troy, thank you so much. This is great. I will send out uh, these links so everybody can um, can benefit from those. These uh, these are new spreadsheets I haven't seen before, so I'm looking forward to digging into those. But uh, thank you very much, Troy. I'll get some links sent out along with a copy of the video if anyone wants to share it with their team. And uh, hope to see see you all next week. Oh, did, Terrence, did you have a question? Or are people waving? I think that's waving. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and thanks again, Troy. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah. Uh, send, send my email out so they can email me if they have questions okay. or comments. I'll add that to the email, too. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.